Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Morrison Planetarium. I hope you're having a great day so far. My name is Cheryl, and I have the pleasure of being your pilot today for this tour of the universe. And don't worry, I'm not just a bodiless voice emitting from the walls. I'm a real person, and I'm up at the control booth behind you. Hello. And now this show is a little bit different than the ones we do the rest of the day because this show is 100% live. I will be flying us away from our home on Earth to explore our solar system, our galaxy, and go out to the visible reaches of the universe. Today, our spacecraft is a software called Open Space that uses updated information so everything that we're going to see today is almost in real time out there in space. Also, this software is built in partnership with NASA and uses models to create a 3D visual of our universe. Finally, the software is also open source, so you can download it for free onto your gaming computers and explore the universe at your leisure at home. Now, before we start, I do want to go over some housekeeping items with everyone so we all start off on the same page. First, I'd like to remind everybody to please make sure you keep your mask on over your mouth and nose the entire time you're in the planetarium. Second, we don't allow eating or drinking here in the effort to keep this space clean for you and future guests, so please make sure if you have any food or drink that those containers are kept closed and tucked away. If you have any electronics with you, like your smartwatches, your phones, tablets, cameras, etc., please take a moment to either turn those off or set them to silent now. As we fly through space today, it's going to get dark in here, so any light or sound from your devices will be distracting to you or those around you. And like I said, it gets dark in here during the show, so if you're standing or moving around during the show, it can be easy to stumble, trip, or even fall in here. So for your safety, we ask that you stay seated for the entire show. If you do need to leave early, not a problem. You can just use the exits at the top of the planetarium. So you're going to go up the stairs to the top exits. Now, everything you see highlighted in purple light right now is going to become a huge screen for you, thanks to the six projectors we have around the dome. So it's going to become an immersive experience today. So if you do feel any discomfort, like motion sensitivity or dizziness during the show, I suggest you close your eyes and take a few deep breaths. That should rem remind your brain that you're sitting comfortably in a planetarium and not actually hurtling through space. All right, that's all for me. So we can get this tour started. All right, so we are going to begin our journey a few hundred miles above the Earth here at the International Space Station, or the ISS. Now, this is essentially a large orbiting research station that slowly gets larger as more modules are added to the structure every year. Astronauts in the ISS work through experiments to learn how things like water, fire, plants, and even our human bodies function under the harsh conditions of space. And they do all of this while casually orbiting around the Earth at an impressive 16 times a day. And you can actually see them pass over you by checking online and seeing what time the ISS will fly over your area. On a clear night sky, it'll look a little bit like a bright little star moving quickly across the sky. Now, the ISS is as far as humans travel into space nowadays. It can house about six astronauts at any one time, and it is the largest object that we have built in space so far. It's about the size of a football field. Now, as we get farther and farther away from our planet, we're going to see how far our human influence has spread, how far humans have physically traveled, how far our spacecrafts have gone, and how far our human communications have gone as well. Now, while the ISS has been the prime destination for Earth's astronauts lately, NASA is developing a new mission to the moon called Artemis, where they will send the first women to the moon and begin the work to establish the moon as a stepping stone for humans to plan missions to Mars. But while we wait for Artemis to get up and fly, let's head over to the moon ourselves. Now, the moon is Earth's closest natural neighbor. And we're coming up on a little bit of a dark moon here. So I'm going to, as pilot, turn on the light so we can see the whole thing and in all its glory. Now, this large rock makes a full orbit around us every 27 days or about a month. And for millennia, this celestial body has been important to humans, helping us keep track of time and inspiring myths and legends of different cultures. 
Now I'm going to fly in a little further here so we can see the many craters on the moon's surface. It may look like the moon's been hit by asteroids and meteorites more often than us, but Earth is a much bigger target and we've definitely had our fair share of impacts. However, the moon does not have any atmosphere like Earth, nor does it have any wind, erosion, or tectonic plates, so there's nothing to erase these craters after they appear on the moon. Now, the moon is as far as humans have ever traveled into space. NASA astronauts Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong were the first humans to walk on the moon's surface back in 1969. And since then, 10 other NASA astronauts have walked on its surface. To get there, they traveled in a cramped little capsule for three whole days. And even though I said earlier that the moon is our closest natural neighbor, it's not close to Earth in the types of measurements we are used to. The moon is around a quarter of a million miles away from us. And as we continue journeying, distances are going to hike up into the millions, billions, and even trillions. And at that point, it doesn't make sense to use miles or kilometers as a measurement of distance anymore. So we're going to adopt a different yardstick to conceptualize distance as we continue touring the universe. We are going to talk about distance using the speed of light. The visible light that we see is part of the electromagnetic spectrum, and it is the fastest thing in our universe that we know of, clocking in at almost 200,000 miles per second. Now, if NASA, was, if NASA astronauts were traveling to the moon in light speed, instead of three days, it would take them about one and a half seconds to get there. So we see the moon is about one and a half light seconds away from our planet. Now, light speed is also a measurement of time, and we'll talk more about that at our next stop on this tour. Now, we're going to continue moving farther away from this Earth and our moon to pay a visit to an object in our solar system that we, as humans, can never visit in person, the sun. So I hope you brought your sunscreen today. Now, the sun is eight and a half light minutes away from the Earth. That means when we look at the sun from Earth, we're seeing what it looked like eight and a half minutes in the past because it took eight and a half minutes for that light to leave the sun, travel through space, and reach us here on Earth. So for example, if the sun somehow ever turned green, we would only ever know about it eight and a half minutes later. Now, our sun is a middle-aged dwarf star, and its gravity holds our entire solar system together. And you know, even if we could visit the surface of the sun, we could not stand on it or land any spacecraft on it because the entire thing is made up of gas that's held together by its own gravity. The star is obviously very important to our survival as well. Its energy keeps us from freezing and fuels photosynthetic organisms on our planet, supporting food chains on land and in the oceans. Okay, now you can stow away your sunglasses because we're gonna head out to the other planets here. And I'm gonna pull up their orbits so you can get a sense of where they sit in space. All right. Now, the planets here closest to our sun are obviously our inner rocky planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, of course, and Mars. And then further out, we have the gas giants, Jupiter and Saturn. Finally, at the very edges are ice giants, Uranus and Neptune. Now, you may have noticed that there's a sizable gap between Mars and Jupiter's orbits. Well, this isn't just any empty space. This is actually where we find most of the asteroids in our solar system. And they're going to pop up here in a second. There's a lot of them, so it takes a second. There we go. Now, this is the main asteroid belt. And back in 2015, NASA actually used a spacecraft called Dawn to explore a particularly unique body within this crowded asteroid belt. It was a dwarf planet named Ceres. Now, here is the orbit of Ceres around our sun. Not a lot of people have actually heard of Ceres, the dwarf planet, but there is another dwarf planet in our solar system that is very popular. Does anyone know the name of that other dwarf planet? You can shout it out if you know it. Well, if you're thinking Pluto, that is correct. We are going out to see Pluto's orbit right now. So Ceres and Pluto have pretty similar stories to each other in a way. When we first found Ceres over 300 years ago, we thought it was the only thing orbiting in between Mars and Jupiter. But around that same time, a lot of astronomers were starting to find a lot of small, 
rocky objects that they were calling asteroids. So Ceres was changed from a planet to an asteroid. And similarly, when we first found Pluto, we thought it was the only object orbiting out here. But then in the late 90s and early 2000s, astronomers started to find all these other objects out here. What they found was a Kuiper belt. Now these are mostly small, icy objects, but some of which are around the size of Pluto. And at least one is almost as big as Pluto. So instead of adding another dozen or so planets for all of us to memorize in school, astronomers around the world got together and created a better category for these small objects. They called them dwarf planets. So now there are three requirements for anything to be a planet in our universe. One, it needs to be orbiting a star. Two, it needs to be large enough or massive enough that its own self-gravity can pull it into a round or spherical shape. And three, it needs to have cleared its orbit. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I definitely lost Pluto in this big Kuiper belt mess. So it's obvious that Pluto goes right through that Kuiper belt and doesn't have a clean orbit. So as of 2006, we don't call it a planet anymore. But Pluto still orbits the sun and is big enough to be a sphere. So it's a dwarf planet. And I know now a lot of people were kind of sad that this was changed because we called Pluto a planet for about 70 years. But I like to think about it like this. Now, Pluto is the biggest dwarf planet in our whole solar system. Okay, while we're out here and we have Pluto's orbit in view, let's check in on how far we've gone so far. In light speed, to get from one side of Pluto's orbit to the other would take us about 10 hours. So that's 10 light hours across. Now, while humans haven't traveled to any of the other planets in our solar system, we have sent robots like rovers and probes and other unmanned spacecraft to explore for us. Now soon you're gonna see some orange lines here that are coming out from the Earth. These orange lines are showing how far our fastest and farthest spacecraft have traveled so far in space. We have Voyager 1 and 2 and Pioneer 10 and 11, all of which were launched in the 1970s. And then the most recently, the New Horizons spacecraft, which went out to Pluto in 2015. And you can actually see the New Horizons spacecraft trajectory there on the right as it uh, intersects Pluto's uh, orbit there. Now, they have traveled fast and they have journeyed far for sure, but even still, these spacecraft have only gone as far as light can travel in a single day. So that should give you a little sense of how far we still have to go. So now we're gonna fly even farther away from our solar system because I wanna show you the farthest our human technology has reached in the entire universe. And to do that, we're gonna to have to keep flying out a little farther. So here you can see the true brightness of our sun compared to the other stars around us. And now we can start to see the radio sphere. So this radio sphere, it shows how far the first radio and TV signals have traveled since we first broadcast them. The earliest radio signals that were strong enough to escape our planet were sent out in the 1930s. So this radio sphere is about 90 light years away from us in all directions. And radio waves are part of the electromagnetic light spectrum. So in a vacuum-like space, they also travel at the speed of light. Okay. Now, while we're all the way out here, let's also check in on the other planets that astronomers have identified. Every one of these markers that we're seeing is a star with at least one exoplanet around it. That's what we call a planet that's outside of our solar system. Now, we've found thousands of exoplanets so far. And if you look carefully, you can see that there are several planets inside the radiosphere. So, who knows? Maybe there is something or someone out there listening to our old broadcasts, perhaps of I Love Lucy. I don't know. I think that'd be pretty cool. But let's keep going because we're still just flying past stars in our galaxy. We haven't even gone outside the Milky Way yet. As we zoom out here, I want you to keep an eye on the radio sphere and see how long you can keep track of it. Soon, we'll start to see the large scale structure of our galaxy. We live in a spiral galaxy, so it's pretty flat like a disk and has spiral arms of gas, dust, and stars. We're in one of those spiral arms about two thirds of the way from the center. And right at the center, you'll see a bright group of stars that are closer together. 
And if you could see past all of those stars right to the very center of the Milky Way, you would see, well, basically nothing because we have a supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy, and it's about 4 million times the mass of our sun. Okay, I'm going to pause flying for a second. So you can take a second to see where that radio sphere is. I'm going to try and point it out. Let me know if I got it. I think it's right there. So that tiny dot right there, that is the farthest that any of our human communications have gone out into space so far. And now we're up to distances of thousands of light years. From one side of the disk to the other, our galaxy is about 100,000 light years across. But of course, our galaxy with its roughly 400 billion stars is just one galaxy out here in the universe. Every dot that we're seeing now is not a star, but another galaxy with its own billions or sometimes trillions of stars. And the colors of these galaxies may make it seem like someone accidentally spilled some cosmic skittles into the universe, but these aren't the colors of the galaxies themselves. The colors represent the different surveys that were used to map these galaxies and the different densities of these galaxies. Now, if we zoom out far enough here, we're gonna see a strange shape that these galaxies seem to form. It's gonna look kind of like a butterfly or a uh, hourglass or even a bow tie, that kind of a shape. Now, the universe is not actually shaped like a butterfly or an hourglass, though. I think that'd be pretty neat, but it looks like this because we are looking out at the universe from our perspective on Earth. So this here is a map of the galaxies we can see and have found so far. And since this is from our perspective, it makes a few things look a little strange. For one thing, it makes it look like we're right at the center of everything. But as far as we know, there is no center to our universe. If you were to go to any of these other galaxies, it would also look like you're right at the center with everything else moving away from you. And the other strange thing is we have this big gap up here and this large gap down here that helps make that butterfly type shape. Now these strange gaps are here because our own galaxy obstructs some of our view of the universe around us. Our galaxy has a lot of gas and dust and stars in it, and these things are blocking our view, making it difficult to see other galaxies in those directions. So there are even more galaxies to see and map in those directions, but this is what we've seen so far. Now, if we go a little bit farther, we're gonna start to see some of the earliest objects in our universe. They're quasars the bright cores of some of the first ever galaxies. And you're gonna see them in these red dots here. Now I say they're the earliest objects because any time that we look at something in space, we're kind of time traveling because the light from these objects has to travel so far that by the time it travels all that distance and gets to our telescopes, we're seeing the light of these objects as they were in the past, not how they look today. So for example, when we look at the closest star to us on Earth, which is four light years away from us, that's how the star looked four years ago, not how it looked today. So now we are seeing the universe as it was billions of years ago. And interestingly, that means there's only so far that we can actually go. And there's an edge to everything that we can see in our universe. And that edge is all around us now. This is the cosmic microwave background, or the CMB. Now, if you had a radio telescope that could see in the microwave range of the electromagnetic light spectrum, you would see this everywhere you look in the sky. In fact, the first radio astronomers were pretty confused by this. They said, wait, what's going on? Why am I getting interference everywhere that I look? But soon they realized that this was actually something that they were seeing out in space when they were looking through their telescopes. So right now, this is a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang would have happened. So you can actually think of this as a baby picture of our universe, the first light that we can see. But since this is the first light we can see in the edge of everything we can see, that means we can't go any farther. So now we've reached the end of our journey today. And I'm gonna to start beginning our descent back to Earth. 
Now, if we were actually this far away in space and we were actually flying at the speed of light, getting back to Earth would take us about 13.7 billion years. But thankfully, we're in a planetarium, so it should just take about a minute. Now, one more thing I want to point out as we zoom back home here. All of this that we've looked at today, all of these stars and galaxies and the cosmic microwave background, that's not even everything that's in our universe. There's dark energy, a mysterious force that's causing space itself to accelerate as it expands. There's dark matter, a mysterious substance that doesn't seem to interact with light at all, but we see evidence of it in between and at the edge of galaxies. And we call these things dark energy and dark matter because we're not quite sure what they are yet, but we do know that they make up about 96% of our universe. So everything so we've seen so far in this tour, that's only about 4% of everything that's out there. And sometimes this knowledge makes me feel very tiny because we're this one little dot in a humongous universe. But then after some reflection, I remember that even as a small dot, Look at all that we have found so far, almost entirely just by looking through telescopes. So there's a whole lot more to discover and a whole lot more to learn about. And that's what makes this such a wonderful time in human history. We're able not just to learn these things, but to share them like this, mapping the cosmos in three dimensions. We're finally starting to unravel the true nature of the universe, but we're still only starting to unravel it. And the rest, well, that's gonna be up to the next generation of scientists back home on Earth. And so we'll head back to that third planet from the sun here, the only place in all of this, by the way, where we have found life so far, which is also pretty incredible to think about. Our small blue and green home is a pretty special place in the universe. So I'm gonna drop you all off back home on Earth and conclude this tour of the universe. Thanks for coming.